Welcome to Dig, a history podcast. Welcome to part two of our episode on the military revolution. Before we get going, we're going to do a quick recap of what we talked about in the first episode, just so that we're all on the same page. If you haven't listened to part one of this episode, head on over there and listen to that first before listening to this one. All right, so let's just summarize all of this really quick before we get into the rest of the episode here. Um, the military revolution happened over the course of 250 years or so, so about 1500 to 1750. Firepower improved parallel to fortress architecture, uh, which resulted in protracted battles with massive casualties. The increased casualties paired with the tactical drilling that became necessary as troops realized that their old formations made them easy targets for gunfire. Uh, this ultimately required exponential growth in the size of armies. They were also forced to change how they were mustered and maintained. Monarchs could no longer make do with small militias and wartime mustering. Instead, most nation states maintained standing armies and soldiers rotated in and out of combat. These armies boasted of tens of thousands and then sometimes the hundreds of thousands of troops. Wars became less decisive, more brutal, and the only way to win them was to decimate the enemy with attrition. The logistical puzzles caused by war on such a large scale forced nation states to develop large bureaucracies that were charged with funding, organizing, and executing military expeditions. I'm Marissa Rhodes. And I'm Elizabeth garner Mazarek. And we are your historians for this episode of DIG. Maybe we should mention a few concrete examples so our listeners can get a sense of the context and the scale of these wars. Because right now we're kind of just saying wars in general and right. people in general. So the French Wars of Religion, it was these were many um, small civil wars over the course of the 1560s through the 1590s. The estimated casualties for the war French Wars of Religion were 2 to 4 million. Okay. Um, the Thirty Years' War, which went from 1618 to 1648, resulted in 8 million dead. Um, and for our last example, the Seven Years' War, um, we know this in America as the French and Indian War. Um, it was from 1756 to 1763. Uh, total casualties numbered close to 1 million, so it's a little smaller than these past two wars. But 725,000 of those uh, were on one side, the French-Austrian side, and an estimated 33,000 civilians were killed during that war. Right. And that was also only seven years where the other ones were 30 years. Right. Each, it was only seven know? years and it was in places that were not super densely populated. Right. So 33,000 civilian deaths was pretty intense. Yeah. These numbers are so large that they start to almost mean nothing. I mean, when you say 8 million people sure. dead, it's yeah. just sort of like, okay, whatever. Um, it's just so hard to imagine such massive loss of life. But for the rest of the episode, we're going to discuss what the military revolution meant for ordinary folks who were living and apparently dying at the time. The strategic and logistical complexity of conducting war in this new context heightened the effect of war on society. Most early modern people encountered these changes in several ways, and we'll just mention a few of them. Mm -hmm. So many innocent civilians were killed during this process, as we can see with the 33,000 civilian death toll in the Seven Years' War, or the French and Indian War. Um, ordinary folks, uh, so plebes, you know, plebeians, uh, they suffered death, destruction, and the strains of mass mobilization of up to a quarter of its male population. Many nation states were unable to pay their troops enough to keep them around, so desertion rates were high. And most commanders sweetened the pot by allowing troops to loot and plunder households and businesses along their path. Small villages were also gutted by conscription, especially during times of famine. So when people were starving and had no work and had no food, the military seemed like an attractive option. French commander Marshal Villar wrote, quote, It might well be said that it's an ill wind that blows nobody any good, for we could only find so many recruits because of the misery of the provinces. One could well say that the misfortune of the masses was the salvation of the kingdom, end quote. 
Prussia, for example, had the fourth largest standing army in Europe, but it was only the 13th largest state in terms of population. One quarter of all Prussian men were conscripted into the army for the Seven Years' War alone, and 14 out of every 15 of them died during the war. That's that's insane. Yeah. Ugh. So compare, comparing that to World War II, where only 3% of the British male population was conscripted into its military at the beginning of the war, and only 3% of those who served died, those numbers are tiny in comparison to what Prussia suffered in the 1760s. So we're talking disastrous levels of demographic change here. Right. And I think it's good to compare it to modern wars. Obviously, there's tons of... It's not a perfect analogy, but um, it's interesting because it's a more familiar context, World sure. War I and World War II, to most people. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like, think about it. With World War I, um, young men and women from that era are called the lost generation because the war was so disruptive to their culture and their demographics that it left a gaping hole where their normal lives should have been. Um, and there's, you know, a whole literary tradition that kind of grew out of this. This same process occurred in the early modern world during periods of intense warfare. It's probably good to mention that deaths weren't the only destructive force, though. It's true that almost exclusively men served, but women suffered immeasurably as well. They experienced the economic and emotional hardship of long absences or deaths of spouses, sons, other kin, and neighbors. Frontier towns and rural areas were particularly affected by this constant shifting of population during wartime. A study of 1,500 troops recruited into the French army for the Thirty Years' War tells us uh, where these army conscripts were coming from. 52% came from small towns, which contained less than 15% of France's population, and the rest were peasants from small rural villages that dotted the French countryside. So the demographic stress of these large armies was not applied equally to all areas. Some parts of France supplied 12% of their total population for military duty, while more urban areas supplied less than 1%. All of that manpower that peasants were feeding to the nation's army was displaced from their homes and their fields. If you're fighting in wars, you're not hoeing the fields or harvesting wheat or whatever. So the people left, women, children, the disabled, the elderly, have to shoulder the burden. Some women accompanied the troops in order to tend to the practical needs of their relatives, since at this time, the military tended not to nurse, cook, or launder for troops. Now that's kind of standard, but at the time it was not. One Bavarian regiment in 1646 consisted of 480 infantrymen and 481 cavalry troopers. So that's 961 fighting men. Let's say about 1,000, right? Yeah. Well, their entourage, so these are people who are not fighting, included 416 women and children serving in various capacities, including prostitution, Mm -hmm. um, 310 servants, and 12 settlers. Um, settlers were civilian merchants who supplied victuals for the troops, so they kind of had like a wagon. They'd come along and... Uh, a chuck wagon. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, all of these people and animals needed to be fed, housed, etc. And their lives were disrupted for the entire war. And I guess just to kind of reiterate, so like these women and children and all of these what we would call or what they called camp followers. Mm-hmm. So they're they're some of them are wives, right? Absolutely, um, yeah. A lot of the women are uh, doing laundry, right, and cooking. Yep. Right. Okay. Yep. And they would bring, you know, teenage. If if someone didn't have a wife, they might bring a teenage daughter or a neighbor. You mm-hmm. know, because men would, would not that. do their own laundry. Well. Men never do their own laundry. <laughs> but I mean, they really would. <laughs> what world do you live in? No. Because what are the, um, Kathleen, Kathleen Catherine Brown? Kathleen Brown. Yeah. yeah. In, um, uh, unruly, is it Unruly Foul Bod- Bodies? Foul Bodies. I yeah. mean, she like specifically states like, like men would die because they wouldn't yeah. do their laundry and they were like wearing such filthy clothes. Right. Um, that, you know, like women were such an integral part to the uh, American revolutionary forces. Exactly. Because otherwise, yeah. you know, you get a little cut, but you put on this shirt that's got like grime and dirt and maggots all over it and then you die because right. you won't do your own laundry and yeah you and never heal yeah. because I never about yeah they that. just yeah that's that i mean and that explains a lot about my life personally <laughs> i think i if i can interject i mean you can cut this but i think this is interesting because i've never read that oh you should I read think it. it adds an interesting element when you learn about chinese laundries i think it makes adds some context to why the chinese when they are living in the particularly in the American West, are opening up laundries. 
and it becomes part of like the rejection of the Chinese that they're doing this. That males are doing laundry. Gendered work. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And I always thought like, oh yeah, okay, women in laundry, like it makes sense from our perspective today. There's still that kind of association. Mm-hmm. Right. But I just didn't real. I never thought of it as being as intense as you're saying that right. men just did not do yeah, laundry. So those single men that were going out west um, to, you know, mine or whatever, right. right? They, they, they would not do laundry because that is not men's work. Right. Right. But the Chinese were willing to do it. Sure. Because yeah. they don't have those same cultural associations right. with laundry. Right. That's and really interesting. Yeah. Yes. I think in this, in this particular case, when it came to traveling armies, the laundering was like kind of part of the nursing, you know, right. like it's part of it's mm-hmm. you're, you're taking care of this person's body, making sure it's hygienic and, um, you know, that it's healing from its wounds and things sure. like that. Absolutely. So that it all kind of comes part and parcel. Mm-hmm. So getting back to the narrative here, ordinary people living in continental Europe during the 16th uh, through the 18th century were particularly impacted by wars of religion. The religious aspect of war cultivated providential ideologies that were held dear by citizens of European nation states. Historian Linda Colley, for example, argues that Britain's military success against French French Catholics inspired a sense that they were a divinely favored Protestant nation, an ideology that served them well in colonial exploits. The German wars of religion resulted in constantly shifting territories and state-sanctioned confessions throughout the 16th and 17th centuries. Early modern Germans were legally subject to the religion of their rulers. Lutheranism and Catholicism were the only two viable options in the 16th century. Only after the Peace of Westphalia in 1648... That was the end to the Thirty Years' War. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, in in 16... 48, uh, was Calvinism a legal confession? Um, Of course, no one could alter someone's interior spiritual world with the words of a treaty, but daily life, uh, much of what was shaped by religious sacraments, was transformed by constant changes in, quote, legal religion. Um, So should I go to mass or not? Can I wear a crucifix or not? Is it illegal for me to read the Bible or is it encouraged by my religious leaders? Do I need to pay indulgences or do good works to get into heaven? Or is my belief in the Trinity enough? Right. So these kind of questions come up. It sounds exhausting. It really does. does. (laughs) Now, I mean, so just a question. When you say that uh, Lutheranism or Catholicism were the only two viable options, were they... Were those simultaneous, or were they yeah, back and they, forth like in Europe, like in England? Like no, they weren't Mary? simultaneous. I mean, they were one ruler, one prince okay. of some small German duchy would say, oh, "I am a Lutheran," and then all of his people had to be like, okay. "We are Lutherans too." And same thing. Um, okay. When someone declared themselves a Catholic, all of their um, subjects needed to declare themselves Catholics. Okay. So what I'm talking about is this. You know, what it's you know you were kind of told what it was okay to believe and this were all kind of hinging on which monarchs won which wars sure so this is state-sponsored religion right and but you must conform right and that's something we see throughout history and the uh the legality of various denominations of christianity was entirely dependent on the outcomes of religious wars being fought in the style we described in the first half of the episode so this is kind of where it connects mm-hmm. um the french wars of religion in the 16th century resulted in the extermination of exile of many huguenots um, most of whom were middle-class tradesmen so huguenots are just french protestants mm-hmm In fact, the Netherlands and England benefited from Huguenot exiles. Many Huguenots were skilled textile producers. They brought their skills and experience with them and are credited by some historians like Jan de Vries, who's like my total favorite, and I geek out whenever I talk about him. Um, They're credited as being one of the reasons why the Industrial Revolution started in England and the Netherlands rather than anywhere else. Right. Because the Industrial Revolution was fueled by textile industry. Right. Right. Exactly. So they're kind of losing these super talented... Um, people, France is losing these super talented people um, because of these wars of religion. Yeah. The St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre in late August 1572 is one example of this that a lot of history nerds already know. Uh, Catholic French Princess Margaret of Valois was to be married to the Protestant Henry III of Navarre. 
In preparation for the nuptials, many of Henry's Protestant relations came to Paris. So there was a little bit of an impromptu swell of Huguenots in the city. Parisians were generally staunch Catholics, so there was some tense weirdness going on all around the city. And at the same time, knowing that lots of Huguenots were in town, Charles IX of France ordered that their top leaders be assassinated. So he's like, ooh, I'm going to take advantage of this with some yeah. strategery. <laughs> but <laughs> the, um, the targeted killings quickly snowballed into a massacre of anywhere from 5,000 to 30,000 Protestants. Oh and I know it's quite a dramatic range, but that's kind of what we've come up with historically. It's like um, the real life version of the Red Wedding. The is. Red Wedding. No, that's oh, exactly what it is. Awful. That's why I thought you would know what it is, because that's what, yeah, that's where they get it from. That's, no kidding. Yeah. Um, so this is all over the course of a day or two. Okay, and this is why it was so important. And this is going on in the city. In the city limits, oh yeah. So this is why it was so important to conform, or at least to appear to conform, right. to the legal religion in a particular area. It could be a matter of life or death. Mm -hmm. And um, legal religions were usually determined, at least on the continent, by religious wars and the loss and gain of territory over the course of months. Mm-hmm. Elites also felt these military changes acutely. One might even argue that the military revolution caused the fall of the aristocracy, which culminated in the Republican revolutions in the late 18th century. Because of these changes to warfare, the medieval tripartite, meaning three-way, uh, division of society into the states of clergy, nobility, and commoners became increasingly obsolete. The decline of cavalry, um, traditional elites, because they owned horses and they were fancy and stuff, um, and the <laughs> rise... The, the, yeah. The best costumes. Exactly. Yeah. And the rise of infantry, traditionally commoners, because they were just guys, like, walking around, um, deprived elites of their traditional roles as noble knights or true noblesse de pay. That's what they're called in France, nobles of the sword. Uh, skilled commoners were also able to make fortunes and names for themselves as professional military contractors. So the social hierarchy was sort of falling apart. Um, and don't don't worry too much about the elites, though, because I know you were worried, Elizabeth. I don't was worry. Very worried. Yeah, no, they are mostly resilient, and they ended up filling the posts of uh, <laughs> military officers instead of these like valiant knights that they might have been in the medieval era. Gotcha. As we've already mentioned briefly, the military revolution resulted in the professionalization of military specialties. Siege engineering, for example, became a specialized area of study at Leiden University. Professional architects and engineers were employed to assist in the planning and execution of complex military maneuvers. Um, and this was also the first time that nation states agreed on laws of war. One solution to the logistical problems that rulers faced at this time was relying on specialists. This offset some of the costs of raising and maintaining such massive military machines. Ferdinand II, for example, contracted out to the very successful Albrecht von Wallenstein. Say which, that again. Oh my god, I just love his name. <laughs> Albrecht von Wallenstein. Um, in the initial phases of the Thirty Years' War, it was Wallenstein and his professional troops who had figured out that volley firing technique that I'd mentioned earlier and um, developed the new formations for firepowered warfare. Salaried professional co uh, commanders and infantrymen were often brought in uh, to pad the state's massive army. Russia, in particular, recruited foreign mercenaries in large numbers. Between 1630 and 1634, Russia enlisted 17,400 foreign professional soldiers. This created a whole new subset of skilled workers for second-born sons and other itinerant men who struggled to land careers in their hometowns. Of course, these social changes did not affect all nation states at the same time and in the same way. In fact, historian John Brewer argues that Britain didn't really participate in the military revolution until much later than the continental powers. He argues that its 16th and 17th century involvement in continental wars was defensive and occasional. It wasn't until 1688 when Britain really became a contender in continental warfare. This marks the beginning of the reign of William III, early modern Britain's first continental-born king. In fact, three out of five of the British kings that followed, William III, George I, and George II, were born on the continent and maintained active interests there. So there's always been this big 
divide between continental Europe, so France, Germany, um, Belgium, you know, and Britain because it's an island right. and it's, you know, separated by the channel. So, like, the British think that they're special or something. But starting in 1688, most British kings, the majority of them, were born on continental Europe. Hmm. So they were kind of dragging Britain into these wars. Okay. Britain is also a really good example of the bureaucratic growth that resulted from the state having to provide logistical support for these large armies in long wars. Um, by 1688, Britain was becoming one of the wealthiest states due to its successful colonial enterprises and relatively effective tax structure. I know, like, young taxes. I don't like Actually, that's that. this is the part that's, like, interesting to me. Yeah, really? Because, like, how do they fund this stuff? No, I think it's you know? super interesting, but some people, they're like, taxes, no, thanks. Um, you gotta pay for it somehow. <clears throat> Uh, Britain's military and political success rested largely on its growing ability to routinely raise revenue, develop a public deficit, and to administer to the growing logistical needs of military big business. So they got really good at the money side of this. Yeah, well, you have to if you have these kind of numbers, right? Right. So the, I guess the question is, who's paying these taxes? In Britain, where excise taxes, which are taxes on luxury goods, were common, it was most people. In France, and is it really, though? I mean, it's most people who can afford luxury items. Yes, but these were small luxury items like tobacco or tea or sugar. Mm -hmm. So even the poorest of people usually could buy sugar sometimes. Like, it wasn't... We're not talking, like, you know... Fine China know. or things like that. Yeah, right? not okay. or or like you know boats or something like these are these are small luxury goods that people consume on a daily basis. Okay, okay. In France, where the tie ruled supreme, the majority of the tax burden fell on the peasants because most elites were exempt from taxation. Hmm. I wonder why that sounds familiar. <laughs> uh, so in some situations, rural villages were not only supplying most of the men for the nation's wars, they were also financing these wars. Uh, for early modern peasants living at subsistence levels, many of them went hungry so that the state could wage war. Prussia was particularly horrible in this sense. About 90% of Frederick the Great's income was spent on warfare. 90%. Right. That's incredible. Yeah. 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 The economic impact of large-scale warfare was felt not only by taxpayers and bureaucracies, it was felt keenly by monarchs as well. But I mean, when I bring up the monarchs, I'm not like, oh, but what about the monarchs? I don't mean that in like, I don't know, some some annoying kind of way. I mean the monarchs as people. It was Charles I of England's involvement in Anglo-French wars combined with wars with Scotland and Ireland that necessitated his calling of parliament that led to the English Civil War and his execution in 1649. So there's this long sort of thing. He wants to wage war. He's dying to wage war. Mm -hmm. And so he, over time, realizes, I have to call Parliament if I'm going to wage war. Because in Britain, you didn't have to call Parliament regularly. You could kind of get away with not doing it. Mm -hmm. So he called Parliament, and that's what started the English Civil War. Um, a few years later, he was dead. So he lost his head over this. So he literally felt this. Yes, literally <laughs> felt it. Um, the financial and political risk that rulers like Charles were willing to endure for warfare tells us that violence was seen as a legitimate way to gain territory and resources. Legitimate and desirable, like a desirable thing to do. Yeah. Europe's successful subjugation of the Americas and Africa is evidence of not only its technological and tactical superiority, but also of its brutal culture of violence. The goal of American and African combatants was generally enslavement of their enemies to control men and labor. European powers' understanding of warfare was qualitatively different, focusing on the extermination of enemy populations and the confiscation of land and resources. We haven't touched much on naval power in this episode, but historian John Brewer has a concept of a, quote, blue water policy, which was a policy of global imperialism in 18th century Britain. It's an example of how hunger for territory and resources was a deliberate goal for European powers in the 18th century, a completely legitimate way to improve your country. So this sort of, um, I think it kind of helps to explain colonial violence in some ways, not to excuse it, but to just explain why this happened. I think it's hard for modern people to understand. Um, I mean, there's very despicable things happening now in our world, but it's hard for us to look back and understand how such despicable violent acts um, as the wars of conquest in Africa and the Americas could ever be seen as an acceptable act of statecraft. 
Um, and that also goes for the transatlantic slave trade. I mean, how is it a thing? I mean, how did someone yeah. not say, this sounds kind of wrong? Yeah. In a time when violence was revered, the results of violent conquest were understood to be divinely inspired. So, um, you know, they're thinking... This is what God wants from yeah. us. This is how, what we are meant to do, right? Yeah. We want to pause here for just a moment so we can hear a word from our sponsor. We are so lucky to be sponsored by our alma mater and Elizabeth and Marissa's current school, the University at Buffalo History Department. We know you're a history nerd because you are listening to us and UB History is offering you the perfect chance to deepen your historical knowledge even more with a master's in history. You can get your master's in history with three semesters full time plus one semester with a single three unit course. Classes are all once a week seminars with small class sizes and lots of one on one study with faculty who are leaders in their fields. Courses are all offered in the late afternoon, 4 p.m., and evening, 7 p.m. The department is intellectually stimulating, but also incredibly friendly and incredibly supported, as I think all of us can testify. If you're interested in museum or nonprofit work, there is a public history concentration available that pairs historical training with business and nonprofit skills. You don't even have to take the GRE to apply. And as an added incentive, the department is currently offering $3,000 fellowships to the first 15 people to enroll for 2018. And additional opportunities for funding are also available to qualified students. So what are you waiting for, my friends? This is your chance. You can get more information about the program at history.buffalo.edu, or you can talk to me personally at 716-645-3433, or Handley2 at buffalo.edu to talk about how to start an application. I hope that some of you will apply. Back to the show. And we shouldn't overstate the number of war deaths resulting from violence, because we're kind of hammering home this point about violence. But um, I want to point out that many of the deaths we've cited today were caused by disease and hunger. The Great Northern War is a good example. This is from 1700 to 7021. Um, Out of the 200,000 Swedes killed during the war, only 25,000 of them were killed by combat. The remaining 175,000 were killed by famine and disease. One Frenchman wrote in 1623, quote, For every soldier who grows rich by war, you'll find 50 who gain nothing but injuries and incurable diseases, end quote. So this is not... This is not a glamorous life. Right, right. Uh, And justly, desertion and mutiny were common. Uh, They sometimes resulted in the disintegration of entire armies. One of the grievances cited by Spanish mutineers in the 1570s was that, quote, many soldiers have suffered and died in the war because there was nowhere for them to be cured when they fell sick. Most of them would have recovered had there been medical assistance in a hospital, end quote. So in response to these mutinies, the first military hospital was opened by the Duke of Alva. It opened in 1585 with a staff of 49. It held 330 sickbeds. Um, Mostly it treated troops with combat injuries, um, malaria, and syphilis, but they also treated troops for psychological disorders resulting from battle trauma. So you can see here that the logistical problems of war and the suffering they called were funneled into some innovative improvements. Sometimes. (laughs) Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. So that's sort of like a positive thing. You know, we're talking about a lot of sad and and sort of scary things that happened. Um, but that's sort of a positive um, way of looking at this is that these innovations that sort of helped people in times of war. Well, and I think that's kind of common even now. I mean, a lot of our kind of the things that we use every day were originally developed for a military purpose. Right. right? Yeah. Or, or yeah. funded through military um, you know, experimentation or what have you. Right. So. Especially things like, you know, I don't know, nanotechnology or whatever. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, a lot of the technological innovation that we um, experience today, you're exactly right. Yeah. But I wanted to ask, what about the term revolution? So Jeffrey Parker um, has argued that the military revolution happened, you know, 1500 to 1750 or about 1800. The, the end point is kind of fuzzy. Yeah. Um, but like the term revolution, doesn't that seem... Doesn't that seem problematic? What kind of revolution lasts 300 years? You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, that's not... So, 
I feel like every time there's a change, you can't be like, it's a revolution. I don't know. When you consider that, you know, people have been walking upright for four million years, that maybe, um, maybe 300 years. I don't know what you're talking about. The world began 10,000 years ago. (laughs) Talking about Lucy. No, I'm just kidding. Or whatever, (laughs) whoever they found since, since then. Since Lucy. You know, yeah, I get it. I mean, it's a major change and we are talking about a period where change happened much slower Right. Because, you know, technology wasn't it wasn't as fast as it is today. So something that would happen within maybe, you know, a couple of decades now would take 300 years. Yeah, maybe. But I also think that it's kind of just our perspective, because if you think about it, we think, oh, technology changes so fast. Like the new iPhone comes True. out like as soon as the old one, you know, as soon as everyone got the old one, whatever. Yeah. That's, like, a trope that people say all the time. But if you think about it, like, think about how long it really does take. I mean, how, it's not like, once computers were invented in, like, the 1960s or 50s or whatever, people didn't actually have them in their homes for, like, decades after that. How long does it take people to get their work computers replaced by new and nice ones? (laughs) Like, you know what I'm saying? This is, like, a slow thing. Yeah. This is a (laughs) slow-moving thing in many ways. Like, the actual logistical, like you know, applications. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. exactly. It doesn't, it's not quite as quick as the history books make you think. And so I think maybe this is what all, you know, quote unquote revolutions, like the industrial revolution and agricultural revolution, maybe they all like, you know, on a particular level seem so slow, Mm -hmm. but still. But they were major shifts in the way that people conducted everyday lives or that states conducted everyday business. Right. Dramatic shifts. Right. Dramatic shifts. Yeah. I want to point out the rise of the West piece of this. A lot of military history revolves around how great the Western world is because it took over half the damn world throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, And there's a lot of self-congratulations here. Some scholars argue that Europeans were just technologically superior, and that's why they conquered the New World and their colonial holdings in Africa and Asia. Uh, The argument that Europeans were so militarily successful because they had firepower, it simply doesn't hold up. Right. So China, for just for one example, made a conscious decision to not use artillery extensively because they found them to be really unreliable and difficult to load, which they were. Mm -hmm. Um, And they also had all of the naval, economic and military capabilities that Europeans had at exactly the same time. Um, But they decided not to launch an era of exploration and conquest like the Europeans did. Mm -hmm. Um, At least they just I mean. They did tons of conquests, don't get me wrong, but we're talking in about in the 15th, 16th centuries, right when the Europeans kind of came on this global stage. Um, and this suggests that technological development is not the only factor in the development of your military. The mm-hmm. culture also plays a large part in this, whether a nation decides to embrace certain military technologies. And Europe at this time, as we've kind of shown, was a culture of violence, And that's what made firearms particularly attractive to them. And it's what made firearms work so well for them compared to other. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense, especially talking about the massive movement of people and money. Um, You have to make a decision as a culture that you're going to support that. Right. right. And so mm-hmm. the and so 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 that that social structure and that cultural structure has to support that quote unquote revolution to change. Right. 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 And I think that's something that a lot of people, a lot of scholars miss when they're trying to explain the rise of the West, the quote unquote mm-hmm. rise of the West. Mm-hmm. Um, they miss the cultural part of it. And it's not a culture that is particularly attractive to claim your own, you know, one that is so focused on violence mm-hmm. and conquest mm-hmm. and and killing hundreds right. of thousands of your own people, your right. own subjects. Yes. Right. Yeah. It's like kind of a, a dirty secret type of thing. Mm. We would be remiss if we didn't mention um, some of the heavy criticisms that Europeans had of the use of firearms, though, as well. Petrarch, for example, believed that guns were invented by the devil, and Cervantes' Don Quixote lamented the gunman's lack of skill and honor. So they kind of mentioned that thing that you mentioned about how it's a loss of honor. Mm-hmm. So instead of these, um, you know... Knights who would, like, ride up in all their valor with, you know, their horses and their, I don't know, spikes or halberds or whatever they had. Sure. Um, with the pomp and you the know, circumstance. Right, and, yeah, yeah, like, hacking down their enemies, you know, on the field and declaring victory. Um, these were, you know, just huge amounts of men waging war from a distance. Sure. 
It's that hand to hand combat is gone. It's like bringing a knife, uh, bringing a gun to a knife fight. Right, right exactly. It's, and it's what people say now about nuclear warfare. Sure. It's the same sort of thing. People say, yeah, like, oh, drones. you could just push a button. And, drones, right. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, that's exactly that there is this distancing. Well, mm-hmm. yeah, that whole criticism has happened before, and it was happening in Europe at the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but these criticisms, they really had more to do with the social implications of firearms than they did with the legitimacy of violence in general. So people weren't generally upset that you know, gunfire was so violent. They were concerned with what impact it would have on their social standing and things right. like that. Right, and their ability to inflict violence on other people right. personally. Yes, right. personally, right. yes. Um, so it's just, I don't know, it's really fascinating to me that Europeans held violence in such in such high esteem compared to some other cultures, especially, especially since they did it um, at the same time that they were arguing that they were very civilized mm-hmm. and that they were taking over these, like, you know, savage lands. Right, right. Um, they were really the savage ones in a lot of ways. Which pulls it back, I guess, to religion. Because one of the re- one of the quote-unquote reasons they said they were doing that was to bring Christianity to these quote-unquote savages. Right. Through the end of a sword or the barrel of a gun. Right. So I guess the question is, like, whether there's something about Christianity that lends itself well to violence. Which is a weird question to ask considering most people. Americans would probably disagree with that and say that it's Islam that has that problem. Well, it depends on, <laughs> on what period you're talking. I mean, if we yeah. were if we were talking, I don't know, 40 years ago, it would be the communists. Yep. Do you know In what I'm saying? In the gays. Or, I mean, it just depends on what context you're, you're speaking of. Yeah. Or time period. I think so. Did you have something to add to that, Sarah? You were doing your little, like, I'm thinking. <laughs> I, yeah, I was thinking about about that because, I mean... That's all a matter of, like, perspective. Perspective and perception, exactly. Both Christians and Muslims and, well, probably not all religions. I don't don't think, well, I... You know, I, it always bothers me when people say that, oh, religion has caused so many wars, blah, blah, blah. I don't know that religion caused any of these wars of religion that we're talking about. Um, I think that it kind of made them more virile, more, more violent... Um, gave people a reason to fight that wasn't just for, hey, I'm fighting because I paid these taxes. Yeah. Like, it's, no, it's a, it's a justification. Yeah, exactly. It's a justification. It, it, so It gives you, it, it, I mean, and I guess maybe you could think about it in terms of this military revolution. It gives you something to latch on to in a war of attrition like that. Like, you have to have something right. larger than life to keep doing this. Right, when right? you're being besieged and, you know, all your friends are, you know, dying of dis- and Terry and you're just sitting there you have to think to yourself well you know blessed are the meek or something because you have to there has to be something yeah. larger than than this hell on earth to to keep going right mm-hmm. now it's it makes... hard to motivate people to fight for lower taxes or yeah. whatever yeah right it's... except unless you're american because then, then you're super that into you've that never met. no i i agree with you you, <laughs> you are super into that but even then the, you can't lead men into battle and say, okay, today you're going to put your bodies on the line so that, so that, you For know. For a 2% tax exactly. uh, decrease. You have to put you yourself. You feel very strongly about that. Right. But you need to have something. You need to have. You're protecting the homeland. Mm-hmm. You're fighting on behalf of Liberty, freedom, right. homeland, Christianity. Yeah. There has to be something larger than just that 2% right. tax decrease. Right. You know, you decrease. might agree with that. Right. Also. Right. Right. I guess I was thinking the Whiskey Rebellion, but it's probably... But the Whiskey it's, Rebellion it was, was more, about attacks, but it was also about an attack on independence and masculinity and, and these and a violation of the ideals of the revolution, right? I right. Mean, they were really pissed about the tax, but that was also a, an uprising. It wasn't a sustained war. Right. Right? You can have, a ta- you can have an uprising that's motivated by attacks. But the, the but to, American Revolution didn't continue because every single day they were going, God damn that stamp tax after yeah, five right. years in battle. Right. right. Sorry. This is, no, I, uh, this is great. Um, I, I learned a lot from this, Marissa. I appreciate you doing this research because, yeah. Yeah, I this think it's really my, interesting. my area of expertise in the least, so I love, I love getting this perspective. Um, yeah, I guess I think, I guess I don't like to talk about the technology part of it, like, ooh, like, um, you know, the muskets and the, 
in the halberds and the whatever and like in the trajectories of the cannons and like that kind of stuff seems really boring to me but what's interesting to me is this the logistics like what did people how did they do this like you mm-hmm. don't ever think of that when you hear of you know these sort of legends of war you don't ever think about like damn like how did they eat or like how did they drink and like where did they pee you know just like mm-hmm. things mm-hmm. you don't think and who about brought that food to them and who was making that i mean mm-hmm. yeah when you're talking about these massive armies like the back end of it right so fast and how did they communicate with each other like how you know they just had you know a, a horse with like a message boy or whatever I mean, but it would take days to 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 communicate just one thing, like, "Hey, we're gonna start here tomorrow," yeah. and then you know, like, you don't get the message until that day, and you're like, "Oh shit, we," you know, it's it's just so complex for. I guess people don't. I feel like people don't realize that this period, this that's so much earlier than a lot of mm-hmm. um, history that people are interested in. They don't realize how complex it really was. And and, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but this is you were talking about how sometimes it can. We think of technology as moving so quickly, but it actually sometimes technology moves very slowly. And there's this big debate over whether or not the Civil War was the last pre-modern war or the first modern war. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's one thing that doesn't change very well between this period that you're talking about and the Civil War is things like communication. Like we do have things, like they do have telegraphs and stuff like that, but they don't have them everywhere. Sure. And communication problems, like you were saying, like... You send the guy with the message on horseback and he doesn't get there at the right time and so your charge starts at the wrong time and it's not coordinated. That happened all the time in the Civil War and sometimes made the difference between a victory and a loss. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, well, I think, you know, I think military history sometimes gets a bad rap. I was listening to some other podcast episodes about um, the military revolution and warfare at this time and they think, a lot of people think, that... um, historians in academia these days don't focus enough on military history and that we've kind of written it out yeah. in favor of cultural history. Um, I mean, Which is I, a legitimate uh, It's a legitimate complaint. concern, yeah. yeah. But I personally have read a lot about military history, and I think um, even though my when I read military history, my focus is on the social and cultural aspects of war, I'm still doing military history. Mm -hmm. Like, I guess for me, like, do I really just have to sit here and recount, like, what wars happened when and the size of, you know, each regiment or whatever? Like, does that, to me, that's not really doing history. So I think that we do a pretty good job of doing military history. It's just not what a lot of amateurs call military history. Mm. I feel like they do more of a... A blow by blow. Yeah, but there's like a... It's like an an intense focus on battle and their idea i think some people's idea of military history is an intense focus on the the battle itself the movements of the troops right like mm-hmm. regiment a moved three feet to the left which meant that regiment b was cut off like very getting very very deep into the nuts and bolts at least this is how civil war military gets right very yeah. deep into t- the strategery i don't yeah. want to <laughs> jump in but this is a huge fight among civil war historians and it has been for a few years to the point where there was recently in 2014 the end of 2014 there were two different articles published in the two leading civil war journals that was specifically calling out people who do what we call war studies mm-hmm. which is what you're talking about the social right. and cultural history of war and saying we're forgetting about military history and you need to we need to study military history you can't do war studies without military history and it caused this huge brouhaha like people were really livid about mm-hmm. it mm-hmm. and i tend to agree with both right i mean the stuff that you're talking about today we can't understand war if we don't know how heavy that musket was that people were carrying. We don't know what the experience of right. war was for soldiers if we don't know what what the experience of battle was like or mm-hmm. what their equipment was like or mm-hmm. if we're not using the right terminology. Or how mm-hmm. many of them. Like, you, we don't understand the scale of it if right. we don't talk some numbers. Like, that's why I had some numbers and things in this episode because I thought they need to – it needs to be hammered home, the numbers that we're talking right. about. Yeah. Um, so, no, I think I agree, too. But but I just think, I guess I think that I feel like academia is not doing as bad of a job with this as some amateurs might think. Um, I think that there's just a fundamental, uh, I don't know, disagreement on what doing history actually is. Mm-hmm. And, like, for me, 
much of the that recounting of battles. That's like a genealogy of war. That's not mm. that's not a history of war. That's like a genealogy of war. That's something that somebody who is documenting little tiny things like how people do genealogy. Mm-hmm. That's what that is. Like to me, that's not actually doing history. Mm-hmm. Um, You're but, like a lot of people really angry. Yeah, a lot of people <laughs> might disagree with me, but but that's just how I view it. And I I'm You're fully be, aware. Yeah, your I'm fully aware. Gonna be at blowing yes. up. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm curious. Um, going back to that uh, discussion, um, was that the one with Drew Faust? Like she was kind of in the middle of all of that. I don't think so. I oh, mean, okay. she has a she has an article too that was about why we love the Civil War so much and how our love of the civil war can actually perpetuate warfare in general because mm. we, we fetishize it. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, the two, these two articles were by like two, two really well-respected military historians, Earl Hess and um, Gary Gallagher. And his article was written by, with uh, one of his students, Kath, Catherine Meyer. Um, and they made really good points. And the funny thing is the backlash that came to those two articles was everyone, all of the Civil War historians who wrote kind of responses to it were like, yeah, I sort of agree with you, but <laughs> we also need to talk about, you know, rape. We need to talk about this experience and that experience. And and part of their argument, too, is that this pushback against, quote unquote, dark history, um, the, the darker, mm-hmm. um, more difficult aspects of warfare, they don't, they don't by that necessarily. Hmm. So it's an interesting, I mean, it's been kind of contentious, but I find it all really interesting. I think it's a, those are the kinds of kind of academic cat fights that actually move fields forward. I was just going to say that. I mean, it moves you forward because it, it, it brings your awareness to an area that you might not have considered Mm -hmm. otherwise. And so it makes you consider a wholer version of, of a particular war or what have you. Um, right. And so it pushes Like it forward. that point about bureaucracy blew my mind. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, and that's when I learned that, I was like, holy crap, that's mm-hmm. like where our modern bureaucracy comes from. And now I just started working in a more, I don't know, bureaucratic environment at mm-hmm. UB in the Office of Academic Services. And I am seeing little parts of bureaucracy and I'm thinking to myself, oh man, like military revolution. <laughs> it sounds so stupid, but like that's, the, right. that's what, a, that's what an administration does. It, sure. It's, it, it solves little tiny logistical problems with like lots of paperwork. Yeah. basically. I mean, you mm-hmm. have there. You have there has to be an apparatus to feed, clothe, how mm-hmm. house, train that number of people. You cannot do it. And even just like you said, little pieces of paper tracking soldiers, sure. tracking where yeah. they are, who taking the muster rolls every single day, yeah. seeing who's still in the camp, who deserted, and then tracking them. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. When did they come back? So that afterwards, talk about the mother of all military related pen or military related bureaucracies is the pension bureaus, right? Yeah. Right. Even, well, they didn't have pension yeah. bureaus, but even during my the, period. The, but I know what you're saying. The, yes. Revolutionary War, the Napoleonic yes. Wars, they do have yeah. a, a, Starting, some form of pensions. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So no, absolutely. It, it the 18th bureaucracy. century was when those started. Yeah. Right. Right. No, exactly. And so it, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And right. So we're not just talking boring, like paper pushers. These are people that are like making shit happen through boring paper pushing. Through boring paper pushing. Yeah. yeah. But it all has a purpose and a reason. And if you live in a modern society, then that, that has to be part of it or it doesn't function. Oh, man, now I feel like people are going to think that's a commentary on Trump's gutting of the bureaucracy in Washington. I don't think so. Okay. Uh, But it it kind of is. No, it's cool. No, just kidding. So I guess that's that's really all we have for you today. And we hope you enjoyed this episode um, as part of our series on war. Mm -hmm. And we'll catch you on the flip side. (laughs) The (laughs) flippity-floppity. Bye. Bye. So Charles's army was art fitted, out art fitted, art fitted, <laughs> urban, urban, urban art fitters, art workers. Okay, welcome <laughs> I can't, to Dan. I can't, I can't his <laughs> art works. The Saint Bartholomew's Day Massacre. Oh. Massacre. Yes, you Massacre. <laughs> <laughs> I can't talk to people and not look at them. I just can't do it. I just moved um, Marissa's face physically. Right. That's why she's not. Yeah. <laughs> We're your historians. We're your historians. We're, 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 we're your rural juror. <laughs> <laughs> I f***ing love that show. Oh okay. My God, so good.